Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Tom Zenti, and I have the privilege of serving as the Chief Executive Officer of University Hospitals. I'm pleased to introduce to you today, today's speaker, the 20th Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Jerome Adams. The Surgeon General is the leader of the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps and the leading spokesperson on matters of public health in the federal government. Dr. Adams was confirmed as the 20th Surgeon General of the United States on August 2nd, 2017. In his mission as the nation's doctor, Dr. Adams is committed to addressing the most pressing public health concerns, including the opioid epidemic, oral health, vaccinations, and exploring the links between community health, economic prosperity, and national security. Many of these priorities directly affect Northeast Ohio, which has been impacted by several public health crises in recent years. However, our region's healthcare community, including hospitals, nonprofit organizations, academic institutions, and state and local government officials, also have a tradition of addressing many of our pressing healthcare needs as a coalition of the willing. Some examples of this include the First Year Cleveland Initiative that is working to reduce infant mortality, the Lead Safe Cleveland Coalition, the Center for Health Affairs, an organization representing the healthcare systems in Northeast Ohio, which has commenced the first ever collaborative community health needs assessment, which teams together public health agencies to identify and address public health needs. And the Northeast Ohio Hospital Opioid Consortium, also coordinated by the Center for Health Affairs, which the Surgeon General will visit later today. And there are many more examples where our community and its anchor institutions have rallied together to strategize solutions for the betterment of the health of Northeast Ohio. Research shows that 80% of the factors that determine our health are environmental, behavioral, and socioeconomic. And so it's vital that these elements are taken into consideration as we carry forth our individual and collective missions. I'm proud of the work that University Hospitals has done to reduce healthcare disparities, improve healthcare access, address food insecurity, partner with other hospitals and the Center for Health Affairs to mitigate the opioid epidemic, make strides toward reducing maternal and infant mortality and lead poisoning, as well as contribute $8 billion annually in economic impact and approximately $350 million per year in community benefit. Our success could not have been accomplished without community partnerships, working with our government officials, studying the best practices in other communities, in finding other opportunities to work with healthcare institutions and systems in Northeast Ohio as we seek to achieve Dr. Adams' motto of better health through better partnerships. And so we're very pleased to have Dr. Adams with us today to share his thoughts and perspectives. As the Surgeon General, Dr. Adams also holds the rank of Vice Admiral in the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. And in this capacity, he oversees the operations of approximately 6,000 500 uniformed health officers who serve in 800 locations around the world, promoting, protecting, and advancing the health and safety of our nation. Dr. Adams received bachelor's degrees in both biochemistry and psychology from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, a master of public health degree from the University of California at Berkeley, and a medical degree from Indiana University School of Medicine. Joining Dr. Adams on stage is City Club CEO, Dan Molthrop, Mr. Molthrop was appointed CEO of the City Club in 2013 after many years as a member, volunteer, and a frequent moderator. He's also an award-winning journalist, a former high school teacher, and another graduate of UC Berkeley in their graduate program in journalism. <laughs> Esteemed guests, members, and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jerome Adams and Dr. Matt and Dr. Hi. Um, 
so I, it's great to have you here, Vice Admiral. Um, and I don't know whether to salute you or ask you to check my blood pressure. Um, <laughs> but um, but I want to jump right in and um, with what is seems to be the most pressing crisis, the most pu pressing public health crisis across the country, and certainly one that has affected many communities, uh, just about every community in the state of Ohio, and certainly here in Greater Cleveland, the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, it does not seem to be changing at all. It still seems to be a crisis. There are cases um, all over the country, uh, a very important federal case uh, that is um, that's being worked out over many, many months here in Cleveland. Um, eventually, I suspect that there's going to be some kind of settlement. When that money becomes available to states across the nation, what do you think should be done with it? Well, that's a great question. And first of all, thank you all for having me here today. I can't tell you how uh, excited I am to be here at the City Club and to see the diversity that's represented in this audience here, uh, the, the gender diversity, the uh, racial and ethnic diversity, and it just does my heart good. It does my heart good. I don't see this everywhere that I, that I go. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned that, that it doesn't seem like it's getting better, and I would push back on that uh, really Please. gently because uh, we have to understand there are multiple epidemics. This is a uh, syndemic that we've got going on. It started with overprescribing. And for those of you who've read the book Dreamland, you, uh, you know that a lot of that started here in Ohio and in, and in the Kentucky and, and West Virginia region. We, we've actually decreased opioid prescribing by 22% nationally. So we've decreased prescribing. But what the problem is, is that the pre prescribing really started with a, with a crisis of uh, unrecognized, untreated um, chronic pain. And we tried to throw opioids at it. It didn't work. We started cutting down on the opioid prescribing, but we didn't substitute back in anything else, so people shifted over to heroin. And that was phase two when you saw uh, hepatitis, HIV, many of you heard about the HIV epidemic that happened in Indiana, in Scott County. I was the health commissioner there when that um, HIV epidemic occurred, and we had to institute a syringe service program at a place where that wasn't a very popular idea. And we can talk about that if folks have questions. <laughs> but uh, then you saw fentanyl come in and fentanyl analogs, and now you've seen an overdose crisis. And I, I tell you that because we've made progress as we've attacked the issue, but it keeps evolving. And I think one of the important things to remember is that we've got to get upstream. Mm -hmm. uh, the risk factors for substance misuse, whether it's tobacco, alcohol, opioids, meth, are the same risk factors for cardiovascular disease, the same risk factors for cancer, the same risk factors for diabetes. It's a lack of health and wellness in our community. So to answer your question, what we need to really do is understand uh, how the health or lack thereof in communities leads to negative outcomes and how we can all play a part in leaning into providing affordable, quality, safe housing. How we can make sure everyone has access to a job that pays a living wage. How we can make sure we have complete streets that kids can walk down safely and go out and get exercise. And if we do that, then we're going to build resilient communities, resilient youth, and we're going to lessen the chances that folks will try to self-medicate their mental, emotional, and physical ailments with, uh, with substances. Uh, when you look at the tobacco settlements, one of the big problems with the tobacco settlements is we had a bunch of people sitting down salivating over the money that was going to come in, but they didn't have any public health people, and they certainly didn't have many people from the community involved Try, up front deciding what was going to happen with that money. And once the money gets swept into the general fund, it ain't coming back <laughs> to, uh, to health. And so it's really important as we have these discussions that we make sure we have health and public health folks at the table and that we have community members at the table saying, look, if and when we get this money, X percent of it needs to go towards treatment. X percent of it needs to go towards prevention. X percent of it needs to go way upstream into to preschool, to housing, into all those social factors that we know will ultimately lead to a change in outcomes and cause us to stop playing whack-a-mole. So you have less of a, a specific prescription and more of a prescriptive process, you think? Well, my prescri yes. The, the prescription is engagement. It's making sure that you've got folks at the table who really have the community's interest at heart and not just looking at it as a windfall for the, uh, for the state. And, I, I don't know if someone's going to answer the, ask this question or not, but I think that also uh, bleeds over into the discussion about marijuana. And I'm really concerned that a lot of folks out there are seeing marijuana solely as a cash cow for the, uh, for, for the tax base and for, uh, for private businesses, 
and not really paying attention to the potential impact on youth and the developing brain. And so again, we need to have public health folks uh, involved from the start and a community pu public health based approach to a lot of these health problems and not let the finances dictate uh, the, the direction and the outcomes. Your, um, your thoughts and, and thinking, ongoing thinking about uh, addiction um, are informed by your own family's, uh, your own family's story and I, I want to invite you to share a little bit as much of that as you, as you like. I know you've talked publicly about it a lot. Well, uh, you know, this is a hour talk in and of itself so I'll, I'll squeeze it down into about uh, 60 seconds. I've dealt with this uh, Professionally, cl clinically, I'm an anesthesiologist. So I was trained in acute and chronic pain management. I know about alternatives to opioids, but I've also prescribed my fair share of opioids because I was taught that opioids were non-addictive. They were perfectly safe if you uh, gave them to folks for pain. And so I've seen that evolution happen clinically and tried to be part of the solution by shifting over to non-opioid uh, alternatives for, uh, for pain management. I've also dealt with it in a public health capacity. Again, I was the state health commissioner when we had the largest HIV outbreak related to injection drug use in the history of the United States in Scott County, Indiana, a town of 4,000 people, rural, all white, um, now over 200 cases of HIV, um, an HIV incidence rate that was higher at the time than anywhere in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we're talking about middle America. And, and then many of you have heard my family story, but my uh, baby brother, Philip, uh, is in prison right now. He stole $200 from a vacated property to, uh, uh, to help him uh, maintain his addiction, and he got a 10-year prison sentence. And uh, number one, it cost about $150 to $200 a day to incarcerate someone, which means all of you all are going to pay upwards of a half a million dollars to incarcerate him, and then you're going to pay to do it all over again when he gets out, and you're going to pay to do it all over again when he gets out again unless he actually comes out and overdoses and dies versus $5,000 for a uh, court diversion program, $500 to get him the mental health treatment that maybe would have helped him out earlier on, $50 for a community resilience program. Uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result, and we're not going to arrest our way out of this problem, even though public safety is an important partner in this equation. Uh, I also tell this story because I, I, people ask me, you know, what, what's your biggest uh, concern, what, what's the biggest killer out there? I think in many cases the biggest killer is stigma. Stigma keeps people in the shadow, it keeps people from coming forward for help, it keeps families from admitting that they have a problem. I was talking to a mom uh, whose son overdosed and she said, you know, when people have cancer, folks bring over casseroles and they rally around them. When someone in the community has addiction, nobody brings over casseroles. Everyone talks about them like this. And they, you know, and the family doesn't come, doesn't feel like they can come forward and get help. And I want people to know that addiction can happen to anyone. And, and it's not bad families that it happens to. I mean, my parents managed to raise a Surgeon General, so I think they did something right. <laughs> but they also raised my brother, who's in prison right now. And uh, the more we share those stories, the more folks feel comfortable coming forward. And, uh, and getting the help that they need, both as individuals and as families and support systems. Is your brother doing okay? Uh, you know, he's doing as okay as you can uh, for a young person who got a 10-year prison sentence for stealing $200 to support his addiction. And that's the most honest answer that, uh, that I can give you. It's a blessing that he is still alive because he had eight overdoses over the week, fatal overdoses here over the weekend here in, in, uh, in the Cleveland area. Mm -hmm. And so at least my brother is alive, uh, but he's still not getting treatment. And we know that um, that's not just about the individual. Recidivism rates go down when you give people treatment. Um, it makes it easier for the staff to handle folks because they're not dealing with someone who's uh, withdrawing um, and they're not having to deal so much with diversion when you actually treat people. And it makes it easier for them to reintegrate back into society. So he's alive. That's a blessing, he's doing okay, but we know that there's a much better way to deal with people mm -hmm. like my brother, even if you don't care one iota about him personally, from a pragmatic point of view, there's better ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Senator Portman of Ohio had, uh, was a, a big advocate for the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, yes. CARA or CARA. Um, has that made a difference? It absolutely has. And uh, again, it's easy to, to hear the overdose statistics and uh, the horrible stories 
occur and think that there's not much progress going on, but we've actually significantly increased the availability of medication-assisted treatment across the country and, and uh, no small part because of the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. The problem is uh, the spigot is flowing faster than we, can, uh, than we can drain it out the bottom. And so we need to think of new and innovative ways to ex expand access to uh, addiction and recovery services. Uh, Project ECHO, if you're not familiar with it, is a great, um, great new model. Um, we also need to uh, really lean harder into prevention. We pat ourselves on the back um, because we uh, went from prescribing 95% of the world's Vicodin to 5% of the world's population to 90% of the world's Vicodin to 5% of the world's population. But that means we're still prescribing 90% of the world's Vicodin to 5% of the world's population. Uh, we've got to do a lot more to help folks understand the dangers that exist from diverting opioids. And we've got to lean into mental health. And my brother's story started with unrecogni unrecognized anxiety and depression, untreated anxiety and depression, and he was self-medicating. Mm -hmm. And he started with tobacco, and then alcohol, and then marijuana, and uh, then one day someone gave him pills at a party. Pills that probably got diverted from someone else's medicine cabinet. And so we've got to look at that whole chain of, uh, 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 that whole pathway to addiction for so many folks out there if we're going to turn the spigot off. Um, there's some naloxone on the table, which, uh, you know, if you're, it, everybody's probably thinking, like, what's going to happen with the, the, the naloxone? It's like when you check off, said, if you put a gun I'm going to stick it in you. Gonna, That's yeah. what's going to happen with it, <laughs> to show them that it's safe. Yeah. Safe in a <laughs> <laughs> We actually have some. No, I, I will take it. If, if need be, I'd be happy to take it. But um, we actually have some in our first aid kit here. Um, last year at the uh, at the annual meeting of the Metro Health, there were it was last year, right? Yeah, the the the, uh, the good people at Metro Health were giving out naloxone, encouraging mm -hmm. everybody to take it, um, and we brought some back here because we were in contact with the community. And I don't know who here is addicted mm -hmm. to opioids and who might have a have a need for it. Exactly, exactly. Last year, I put out the first Surgeon General's advisory in 13 years, advising uh, folks to know about and to be willing to carry naloxone. Remember I said stigma was the biggest killer? There's a lot of folks out there who, who, who have a false idea of naloxone as enabling drug use. It doesn't enable drug use, it enables recovery. It enables people to be connected to, uh, to care. And, uh, it enables people to stay alive. To stay alive. And, and I, I just do this really quickly because it, it, it drives the point home um, more than anything else I could ever do. Raise your hand if you know CPR. Oh, wow. That, I didn't expect that many. Okay, it's so, that kind of crowd. So ra raise your hand if you carry naloxone with you everywhere you go. Anyone Look at that. She any, pulled it out. <laughs> anyone notice the difference in hands there? And right here, where you sit, it's actually more likely someone's going to come in that door and say someone is overdosing in the bathroom or out on the street than what it is that someone's going to come in and say that uh, someone's actually having a heart attack out there right now and we need you to do CPR. So we all need to walk the talk. We all need to understand that uh, naloxone needs to become as ubiquitous as CPR. The communities that have been able to turn around their overdose rates have done it by saturating the communities with naloxone. You can go to any pharmacy and get it. You can go to your health department. Um, you, there are so many places you can go to get it, and it's really easy to administer. Uh, this here is the intranasal form. And you, if you see someone who's, who's uh, not breathing, who's got labored breathing, who's blue, who's non-responsive, just do a sternal rub or try to shake them, try to stimulate them. If they don't respond, then uh, you can use your naloxone. It goes in the nostril like this, like a Flonase, and you just press the button once. That's how easy it is to save a life with the intranasal form of naloxone. This is the injectable form of naloxone. It actually talks to you. Black end against outer thigh. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> this is just a tester, so I didn't actually stick him with it. Well, wait, but I, uh, no, just kidding. And see, he's back. And yeah, yeah, that was, that was a close one, Doc. But that's how easy it is to save a life. And I really, I implore all of you to uh, consider, consider carrying naloxone. Go to surgeongeneral.gov, at least read my advisory. Be able to talk about it because we aren't going to turn this thing around until more hands get raised to say, I am carrying naloxone, or I at least know about naloxone, till we get a little bit more of an equivalency between the people who know CPR and the people who raise their hands and say, I can carry naloxone.
So uh, there is so much more I want to talk to you about. We're like, I'm looking at the clock and oh my goodness, we don't have time to talk about it all. Tom Zenti in his introduction though mentioned the 70 to 80 percent of factors, environmental factors, mm -hmm. social factors that really have far more to do with health outcomes than the care that people may or may not be receiving. Um, how, that is a public health, that's, that is public health writ large mm -hmm. right there. And, um, and it is also the legacy of uh, our nation's history of systemic racism. Are those conversations that you, are, is that part of the conversations that you're having in Washington with the core, with your colleagues in the administration? It's absolutely uh, part of the, uh, the conversation that we're having. We're trying, one of my big initiatives is a community health and economic prosperity initiative. And it's really trying to show folks that if you want a more prosperous uh, uh, community, if you want to be more prosperous as an individual, you can't do it if you don't pay attention to your community's health. So uh, really quickly, anyone heard of this company called Amazon? <laughs> it's a small little company, small little startup. Well, they just situated their new second headquarters, which you all were fighting for here, to bring here too, and I situated it in, uh, in uh, Crystal City, Virginia. Now, if you look at Crystal City, Virginia, it is surrounded by four of the top uh, 20 healthiest cities in the United States. That's no coincidence. We need folks to understand that if they want to achieve the, their number one priority, and the number one thing people vote on, Democrat or Republican, black or white, rural or urban, and this is important, number one thing people vote on is jobs in the economy. If they want to achieve jobs, economy wage increases, they can't do it unless they have a healthy workforce. And you can't have a healthy workforce unless you have a healthy community. And uh, healthy communities are about housing. They're about race, uh, racism. They're about, they're about jobs. They're about access to, uh, to, to grocery stores and not living in, in food deserts. They're about all those things. So I'm trying to help folks make that connection so that they understand that it's important to invest in the community. And one more very quick story, and I know we're running short on time, but, okay. no, but this go. one's a... This one's one that, you know, when you talk to folks, they often like to throw um, crazy questions at you, like, tell me your biggest failure. I hate those questions. Tell, but I'm tell gonna us your biggest But I'm going to no. tell you my biggest failure. Um, when I was state health commissioner in Indiana, um, we actually have some of the lowest tobacco taxes in the country. And the science says that if you raise the price, less people smoke. And we know that the number one thing you can do to improve people's health if they're smoking is to get them to stop smoking. And so uh, I really wanted to raise that tobacco tax somewhat. Well, uh, we had a summer study committee before our state legislature, and we had two hours of testimony from the experts. And the experts all came in and talked about how tobacco was bad and how if you raise the price, less people would smoke. Truth is, we already all knew that. At the end, we had 15 minutes of testimony from the business community. The business community was represented by the mom and pop bars, the gas stations, and the casinos. And they said, you know, we don't dispute anything that you're saying, but if you raise those taxes, it's going to be bad for jobs. It's going to be bad for the economy. You know what they, they said? Because everyone's going to run across the border to Ohio and buy their cigarettes. So they said it's going to be bad for jobs and the economy. And far too often, we allow health to be pitted against jobs and the economy. Tw two hours of testimony from the experts versus 15 minutes from the business community. And what was the outcome? The legislator said, equal testimony on the issue, we're going to table it. We're not going to take this on right now because we don't want to hurt jobs in the economy. And so I swore that if I had a chance to do this again, I would make sure I brought more and better representatives from the business community because the number one cost for most Fortune 500 companies is salary. Healthcare. Number two cost is healthcare. And actually the guy, from, I was sitting at a dinner with a gentleman from GM mm -hmm. and he corrected me. He said, no, for a lot of us, the number one cost is healthcare. And the biggest way you can lower your health care expenses is by decreasing smoking. So my question is, well, why the heck aren't you at the table, GM, when we're talking about uh, the tobacco taxes? And so part of my job as Surgeon General is to make that link for folks, to help them understand that there are policies that we can put in place in the community that promote health and promote job creation and wage growth. I, I think a lot of this room would be surprised to learn that you grew up on a tobacco farm. Absolutely. You know, and... It's, it's an interesting juxtaposition. I think it's important that folks understand that uh, people out there, <coughs> folks want to hear me say I'm going to lead with the science. And I always am going to try to make sure the science is as much a part of the discussion as possible. Uh, I had asthma growing up. My grandfather actually died from lung cancer. I knew tobacco was bad for you. I knew the science. 
But I grew up in a poor rural area. And I also knew that if I wanted money to take my girlfriend to, uh, to prom, if I wanted to buy those new tennis shoes, if I wanted to be able to go out and, and, uh, and eat, with, eat with my friends, I needed to take the job that was available in my community. And so I think it's important that we really do a better job of talking to the communities, understanding that their number one priority is their ability to support themselves and show them what a transition path looks like to get from a place where they're working in the coal mines to a place where they can work in a different industry and have a, uh, have a uh, job that actually helps the environment instead of hurts the environment. To show them that instead of working in the tobacco field, there are other options for young men like me who grew up in rural Maryland to not do something which ultimately contributes to the death of their grandfather for the sake of wanting a new pair of shoes. And uh, I believe, I, I'm a Christian, uh, so I, I don't mean to impose my, my religion on you all, but I believe God put me in this position um, because of my unique background, my unique experience. I'm not here so much to be the nation's doctor as I'm here to represent the nation's patients uh, because I come from the poor, the rural, the, the, the diverse. Uh, I come from the, uh, all those different backgrounds that, that don't feel like they've been listened to, quite frankly, a lot in Washington, D.C., and that often folks feel like people in the big city are trying to squash you down and tell you that, uh, that you shouldn't speak up, that you shouldn't uh, have the things that you deserve for the sake of somebody else's priorities. You mentioned uh, just a second ago wanting to, that part of how you see your job is making sure that science is always part of the discussion, that science isn't ignored. Um, you, I'll, I'll be very straightforward, you, you work in an administration that is not entirely science friendly and is, and is often publicly science unfriendly. In particular when it comes to climate change, which has been shown to, is likely having and will continue to have a disproportionate effect on the poor communities and diverse communities that you just mentioned. Um, and those are public health problems as well, that are, that are, that those are adverse health outcomes that are happening as a result of extreme temperatures, whether they be extreme heat or extreme cold, increased asthma as a result of all of that. Um, that's a tough conversation to, to navigate. There's a lot, of, a lot of different science from the biomedical field as well as the climate field. Um, how do you navigate that conversation in a science-unfriendly administration? And well, if I'm mischaracterizing the administration, please tell me. Well, I wouldn't say that they're science-unfriendly. Um, here's what I would say. The key word in public policy is public. And you have to listen to the community. You have to understand what the public is saying and what they're concerned about. And I think it's also important to understand that as much as even I, as Surgeon General, and the doctors in this room, and the scientists in this room, would like to tell you that they put the science first, uh, Raise your hand if sometime in the past week you didn't get up at 6 a.m. and go to the gym. <laughs> Raise your hand if you, uh, ha if, if you had a, a, a few drinks over the uh, Memorial Day weekend. Of course you not. Know, ra you, you, every day um, we, we make decisions. How, how many of you all um, don't regularly get your eight hours of sleep every single night? Every single day we make decisions that go against the science that we know. And we do it because we're incorporating other priorities like I need to do this for my work or I'm doing this for my religious reasons or because it's a, a cultural belief or I'm doing this just because I feel like it, because it makes me feel good to hang out with other people. So uh, we, sh we can't go out there and say that everyone else should put the science as their first priority all the time and we don't even do it in our daily lives. That's number one, but, but, no, but I, I'm, I'm backing, in, backing in the, to your conversation. Okay. And so it's important to understand Again, the coal mine example. I've been to rural West Virginia. There are communities where 60, 70% of com the community works in the coal mine. And you go into that community and say, I'm gonna shut down the coal mines because it's the right thing for the environment. What's that community hearing? You're taking away the job that my grandfather had, that my father had, and the only job that I know of that's gonna allow me to stay in my community with my family moving forward. So I don't think people are anti-science so much as they're pushing back against this notion that someone else from outside is trying to take away their options and not providing them a vision to, to how they can still succeed within their idea of succeeding. And so I've talked to folks, and yes, they want a clean and healthy environment for their children and their grandchildren. They don't want it to be at the expense of, uh, of, of their ability to, uh, to earn an income. And so here's what I'm doing. I'm going out there to those communities, I'm talking to folks, I'm trying to bring together private, public, 
academic institutions and to say, look, what does is, what is the glide path look like to get from point A to point B where we're using more sustainable energy? And how do we train people to be successful in that world? Do you worry, though, that, that you may not be looking out far enough? It's one thing to think, like, okay, I'm in this administration for four years or eight years, or I uh, just, you know, we're going to think about the next couple of decades. But if climate change mm -hmm. is happening, right, it's, it represents a public health crisis in the future, 40, 50 mm -hmm. years down the road, or 100 years down the road, whenever it is, that, that is catastrophic, mm -hmm. potentially. Far more catastrophic than to take to pick another example of uh, science at odds with uh, with public health. It's catastrophic in your mind, the, but to the person who can't pay their rent in rural West Virginia, what's catastrophic is not having a job right now. And 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 I, I hear no, but, what, I, but I, I, hear me, I just want the, the 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 question I'm I, I'm asking is that sometimes science is at odds with um, with the goals of public health or science. Science and public health are aligned, but the goals of others are, are not aligned. Mm -hmm. So the, the vaccination challenge right now with people who would refer to them, who are often referred to as anti-vaxxers, um, that's a real legitimate public health crisis happening right now that is, that is caused by people not believing in science. Um, and, uh, and how do you handle how do you how do you you know how do you decide what's the what's the timeline for what what potential crisis? No, that that's a very good question, and that's the hard part about public policy. And uh, again, with the levers that I have, my lever levers are primarily on the education and advocacy front, and I'm constantly out there promoting my motto of better health through better partnerships. They're just saying that people need to know that you care before they care what you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that whether it's the when we talk about folks who are against vaccinations they're still parents who just want what's best for their kids. And in many cases, they don't feel like they've had their questions answered or, uh, or that people have taken the time to really listen to them. And that's whether you're talking about vaccinations or climate change or many of the other places where people doubt the science. And so my job, I feel, is to help people know and understand that there are people in the federal government who care about them, who will sit down and listen to them. It's why I'm on the road so much. And then once you open that door, then people are willing to listen a little bit more and you find that they are, they are a lot more, uh, they're a lot more reasonable and a lot more willing to change. And we found that with vaccinations. We found that sometimes it takes two, three hours of conversation with someone for them to finally start to trust you. And then all of a sudden you can get them to, uh, to vaccinate. But it doesn't happen at a 15 minute visit when we go in and say, I know better than you. Uh, or when we say, you, act, you absolutely better do it. And he, here's the other thing, and I, I, Dan and I are purposefully being provocative. We, we talked earlier, but, but we wanted, we, we, uh, we wanted to, to bring some of this out. Uh, the, do you all believe in democracy? Yes. <laughs> I, I would hope so, considering where we are. Yes. There's a lot of people who say they believe in democracy, but really only believe in democracy when it delivers the results that they want. And the reality is, as long as we believe in democracy, it's up to us as leaders to make the case to people that they should vote the way that we want them to, that they should, uh, should, 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 should uh, engage in and support policies that we want them to. And in many cases, public health, um, some, some, some of the other folks out there who, who are in favor of some of these initiatives have been, and I'm being guilty of this too, arrogant. Mm -hmm. we, we need to humble ourselves a little bit. We need to be servant leaders. We need to get into the communities. We need to build that trust. And once we do that, I've found over and over again in my career that people are much more willing to listen to you and to uh, turn a little bit in your direction. Uh, but they've been burned in many cases by folks who they don't trust for good reason. And then that discredits everything else that you try to say to them. Vice Admiral Dr. Jerome Adams is the 20th Surgeon General of these United States, and we're going to transition now to the Q&A with all of you. Uh, we welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, those of you joining us via our live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, you can tweet it at the City Club, and our team will work it into the program. Holding our microphones today are, uh, <laughs> are my colleagues Tiffany France and Julia Wong. May we have our first question, please? Mr. Admiral and new young leader. Uh, my question is, and, and two people that I highly respect stood up and talked about the issue of opiates. Mm -hmm. And for us in the community of color, we know why we're having that conversation. But for individuals like myself, 
we know that the leading cause of death for an African-American male between the ages of 18 to 24 is homicide. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, a 21-year-old young man got killed last night in the city of Cleveland. We've had 1,000 homicides in the last 10 years. What's your feeling on the Dickey Amendment? And what can we do to stop young black men from being killed? And how do we get the federal government to understand in communities of color? This is our number one issue. This is our number one crisis. And we need help also the same way we're giving help to this community when it looks at opiates. Thank you for that question. And um, I'll try to be brief uh, because- Be sure to explain what the Dickey Amendment is, please. The Dickey Amendment was, uh, was passed uh, probably 20, 25 years ago, but it, it really um, discouraged federal research into, uh, that, that, that would promote gun control. And gun control is actually a word or a phrase that I, I don't use, quite frankly. I say gun safety. Because this country was founded on people who didn't want to be controlled. And so a lot of times we use the wrong language in the first place. We use language that turns people off. I think whether you own guns or whether you don't own, own guns, we can agree that there are things, steps we can take to, to promote safer gun ownership and to limit access to folks who might do harm to other people. And so uh, that, that's one thing that, that, uh, that I'm definitely trying to do. Here in Ohio, and I live 20 years in Indiana, I, I think it's important for folks to remember, um, there are places in downtown Indianapolis where your neighbor owning a gun is a direct threat to, uh, to your life because folks are living in such close proximity and there are so many other issues going on. I've lived in downtown Baltimore where, where I was really concerned about gun ownership uh, in the wrong hands. I've also lived in Indiana and in rural, I've lived my grandfather's farm, uh, or, or, or grandfather-in-law's farm, we've seen coyotes run across the backyard and uh, his owning a gun was a way of him protecting his livelihood. I've been down in Arkansas and I talked to a mother and I asked her, what are you doing tomorrow? It was a Friday night. She said, I'm going out hunting with my kids. For them, it's a way of building resilience in their communities. So we have to understand how really regional and local this gun issue is and understand that for one, one group, one family in one place, it's a threat to your life and in another place, it's family time. And in another place, it's a way to protect your livelihood. And so what I'm doing is encouraging public safety and public health folks to come together and to talk about safe gun ownership. How, how, do, we talk, how do we go after the low hanging fruit and how do we customize it for different communities? Because, you know, quite frankly, the pendulum may, may, may be in a little different place in Baltimore or in inner city Cleveland than what it's going to be in Bluffton, Indiana, where my wife's family is from. And so we, we need to really promote folks to have that conversation and to figure out how we can have safer gun ownership. And if we do that versus putting ourselves in camps of either everyone owns a gun or no one owns a gun, then I think we'll get a lot closer to, again, that representative democracy that, that is also safer in our society. It's a travesty to me. Uh, gun ownership uh, in the wrong hands is absolutely, is ab and I don't, want, don't even want to say ownership because they're not legally owned, is absolutely a public health issue in some communities. But like I said, in other communities, it's a way of building resilience. And so it's really hard to come up with national policies that, uh, that, that that accommodate Bluffton, Indiana, and uh, in downtown Cleveland. Uh, and, and that's as honest as I can be with you about it. The other thing that we're trying to do, I want to tell you that, that uh, uh, all the folks within HHS right now are very much uh, trying to promote research um, and, and the causes of, uh, of gun violence and, and how we can better promote gun safety. And the CDC has, and I have, promoted several articles that have come out recently uh, from the CDC on, on uh, gun violence, especially among youth, and how we can promote um, a safer environment for everyone. Thank you very much. Next question. Yes, uh, could you uh, talk for briefly about the particular challenges, face health challenges facing immigrant communities? Uh, absolutely, you know, I think we can all agree, no matter which side of the political aisle you're on, that our immigration system is broken. And, um, I, I also want to say to you all that my levers come purely through a public health um, lens and a health lens. And uh, one of the concerns about our broken immigration system 
is the importation of uh, different diseases and different health threats into our country. And again, regardless of which side of the immigration debate you're on, if, you know, and I even hate that because we say which side, uh, like there's two clear sides, but regardless of where you, where you stand politically, uh, I think we can all agree on those things. And so what I'm really focused on is helping folks understand the health impacts on an entire community. If you have someone um, who's got extreme or multi-drug resistant TB that's not being treated. To help folks understand the impact on the community, if you have someone who's experienced adverse childhood experiences, uh, sexual violence, assault as a part of coming into this country, how do we better recognize the, uh, the health uh, risk and, uh, and in turn the, the, how the outcomes impact the entire community if we don't fix our broken immigration system uh, and if we don't, as part of that process, recognize and, and address the public health issues, uh, the vaccination uh, issues that come up. Well, again, a lot of the infectious diseases that come into our country um, are, are brought in from folks who are coming in from, uh, from other places, not necessarily immigrating, in many cases visiting if you look at the measles outbreak that's going on right now. But we really do have to uh, look at where our system's failing us and, uh, and understand that if we don't, it affects all of our health. Next question. Mr. Surgeon General, welcome to Northeast Ohio. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Brennan. I'm the president of Parma City Council. Parma is uh, the biggest suburb of Cleveland. I also happen to be a high school teacher. So as a local elected leader and a high school teacher, I feel like I'm in the trenches of the opioid crisis. Um, but at the local level, we have very limited resources. <laughs> Yet we're extremely frustrated uh, because we're not getting answers as to what we can be doing. So from, from your perspective, what can local leaders, uh, high schools uh, in, in, the, in the trenches, what can we be doing right away to start addressing the problem? Well, both my parents were school teachers. My sister-in-law is a high school principal. Um, one of the things, and, and I'm proud to, to call myself a teacher, you know, I taught for the last 10 years at Indiana University School of Medicine, and I still go to Walter Reed and try to teach every now and then. I think it's important that we all um, take on part of that responsibility of, of, uh, of lifting up folks who are coming behind us. I think one of the things we've got to stop doing is thinking our teachers can do it all. And, uh, well, you know, it's interesting. We go to the schools and we say, hey, we've got this great program that's going to decrease the high smoking rates in your community, and it's only going to take $10,000 in, a, uh, in an FTE. And then we come in and someone else comes in and says, we've got this great program that's going to re reduce obesity rates in your community. It's only going to take $10,000 in an FTE. And then we come in and we say, hey, we've got this great program that's going to address the opioid misuse in your community. And the next thing you know, there's no time left to actually teach the students. So I think that's a great example of, of how we can achieve better health through better partnerships, how we must. We need to, uh, to get back to the idea of the community raising the child and not put it on the teachers alone to somehow fix um, during school time what's broken the rest of the time when folks are out. And that, that involves resilience programs. Many of you all are business leaders. Invest in a YMCA, invest in 4-H, invest in community resilience programs so these kids have something to do after school besides run out onto the streets. Invest in, a, in, a, in apprenticeship programs and uh, job training programs and opportunities for folks to have mentors. Those are all things that we can do that not only help the school and, and help the individual in the short term, but then uh, allow more folks to be eligible to participate in the workforce later on. Disconnected youth, youth who, uh, who don't have a job and aren't in school are a <laughs> rapidly increasing problem in this country. Contrast that with the fact that we have seven million unfilled jobs in this country and only five million people looking for work. All of you who represent businesses, your success is at risk because we don't have a workforce. Uh, one more stat, 70% of our 18 to 24 year olds in this country are in ineligible for military service. 70, seven out of 10 because they can't pass the physical, can't meet the educational requirements, or have a criminal background record. We are a less safe country right now because we're an unhealthy country. And so I've talked to the Surgeons General of the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force and said, hey, how can we get some of your resources, both your manpower and your money, 
and invest them in school programs and bringing folks into schools so that, again, there are positive adult role models around for folks. And again, we're not putting it on the teacher to teach algebra, but also to be a social worker and also to be a, a psychiatrist and also to be an addiction counselor and also to, to, to be a police officer. So that, that's, that's what I think we need to do. And I think we do that by making the case to businesses, to the military, to other folks out there, that this isn't just about this one individual kid. This is about the future of our entire community, of our workforce, of our national security, of our army. And once they see that, then hopefully they'll be more inclined to start investing. And I'm seeing that happen again in many of the, when I approach it that way. When I don't say, help me with my problem of, bad, of, of kids um, and bad outcomes for kids, but let me help you with your problem of military readiness and of workforce. Another question. Yeah, I have a question from Twitter. Obesity is another crisis that mirrors similar treatment gaps, similar to addictions, and not recognized as a chronic disease. It also leads to costly and less productive work workforce. What advice would you give to the business community to respond to the obesity crisis? Okay, so this is a great question because uh, businesses have been leaning on the worksite wellness programs. And uh, one of the things that we're seeing, um, shockingly, is that they aren't changing outcomes. And it's not to say that they aren't, we shouldn't continue to do them. It means to say we need to rethink the way we design our worksite wellness programs. Giving someone a, a free gym membership is a great recruitment tool. And if you actually talk to businesses, that's why they mostly do worksite wellness programs now, is because they're a way to recruit young people in. But they aren't actually changing outcomes. You don't change someone's obesity by giving them a gym membership. You need to change the environment that they're in. When you look at the places in the world where people live the longest, nobody has a gym membership. <laughs> nobody gets on an elliptical. I bet they there don't. aren't donuts in the break room, though. Well, you know, what's interesting is there is a lot of camaraderie around food. It's social connectivity, but it's also an environment that is designed to encourage people to be active and to be active together. And so what I would say to businesses is it matters if you're leaning into the built environment around you, into your community design, complete streets. Um, making sure there's a safe neighborhood out there. Making sure um, the stairs are easy to access within your community. In many cases, you can't find the stairs even if you wanted to. I try to take the stairs and half the time I give up in buildings because you can't find the stairs. Um, when you're building a new building, building the staircases so that they're um, in the middle and easy to get to and that the elevators are harder to get to. There are environmental design things that we can do that will do a whole lot more to get people active throughout the day uh, than actually giving someone a gym membership and expecting them to go and exercise 20 minutes um, three times a week and that that's going to turn around our obesity rates. So leaning into policy, CDC high five um, interventions uh, are, out, are out there. There are policy interventions that folks can lean into that will do much more to lower smoking rates and to, uh, to lower obesity rates and to really improve health than, uh, than giving someone $25 off of their uh, off of their deductible for, uh, for, for pledging to be smoke free, um, but then sending them back home to an environment, uh, to, to housing that's not smoke free. Thank you. Next question. Hi, Dr. Adams. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Steve Porter. I'm an OBGYN at University Hospitals. Um, and you've, you've touched on a range of um, really important public health issues, all of which I think um, um, deserve our concern and merit our attention. Um, but I want to I wanna ask you specifically about maternal mortality. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the statistics I, I know are well known to you, but for the benefit of some of our colleagues, we are the only industrialized nation where maternal mortality is on the rise. Um, and beyond that, um, even after you control for socioeconomic status, we see worse maternal health outcomes associated with women of color mm -hmm. in this country. And so I want to ask you, what accounts for this public health crisis in our country, and how do we tackle it? This is a place where um, there is a very deeply embedded racial component. A uh, black woman with a PhD is more likely to have her baby die in the first year of life than a white high school dropout in this country. A and just to be perfectly honest with you, Folks are still digging in to try to figure out why. And there's not one easy answer, but we know that race is a big part of the equation. It starts with what are we doing? You're not going to be a healthy mom and have a healthy pregnancy if you haven't led a healthy lifestyle up until this point. And I don't mean led in terms of it's on the individual, but I mean if you're not in an environment where you can be healthy and make healthy choices about 
um, when and how you're going to get pregnant, if you're not making healthy choices about, about what you're eating and, uh, and how you're supporting yourself. Um, they, we know that in many cases these maternal mortality events are happening because uh, black women are being ignored when they call in and say that they have symptoms or they're not giving, being given the uh, proper discharge criteria. There are so many places where bias um, and, and uh, long-term uh, racial issues have been embedded into our system uh, that it's really hard to, to put our finger on one thing. But I think what we have to start by doing is, uh, is having maternal mortality review committees and taking a serious look at the data. Because if you don't measure it, you can't move it. So we need to dig into each of these cases because as with infant mortality, each one of these cases, there are commonalities, but each one of these cases is individual. In one case, it may be domestic violence. We know that one of the top uh, causes for maternal mortality are mental health issues. And so uh, really unpacking it and then starting to move forward towards how do we start to change the environment, the system, the structures that lead to these horrific outcomes. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to really get work with folks from the CDC and actually issue a Surgeon General's call to action on maternal mortality sometime in the next year because as you mentioned, the statistics are just too shocking, too harrowing for us not to consider this to be an emergent issue. And the health of mothers is the health of, of America. You're not going to have healthy babies and healthy families if you don't have mothers. You're not going to have uh, healthy dads if you don't have healthy mothers. I mean, the dads and the, the husbands in the room know um, your, your health is directly related to uh, how many times your wife tells you not to eat that or to get out there and exercise or to go and do, but if mom's not healthy, then no one else is going to be healthy. So, do you have another question? Yeah. Oh. Hi, to tag along to what you said, I'm Sandy Hoke from Metro Health. Um, our infant mortality rate is incredible also in Cuyahoga County. And the number one thing that we're trying to work on in addition to bringing the rate down is smoking and its relation mm -hmm. to infant mortality. So we know that 73 to 100% of our sleep-related deaths, those babies live with smokers. Mm -hmm. And Ohio is doing a great job of getting programs out to mothers to help them stop smoking, but mothers don't live alone. Mm -hmm. They live with men who are either don't have insurance sometimes or don't qualify for insurance, or parents who don't want to quit smoking. And what are your thoughts on how we can get programs to recognize that you can't quit if your partner is still smoking, you can't help your baby if you quit, and everybody in your home still smokes. So when I was the health commissioner in Indiana for three years, my big um, priority was infant mortality. And there's a lot to unpack there. I love the Baby and Me Tobacco Free program. One of the things we did was extend that to dads. And say, so Baby and Me Tobacco Free is when you get a $20, $25 voucher for, uh, for pledging to be tobacco free. And they actually test the moms when they come back in. Well, we did that and it was successful. But as you mentioned, if you go back to an environment where dad is still smoking, that makes it harder for mom to quit and you're still exposing, exposing baby to smoke. So they started to give dad vouchers if dad pledged to be tobacco free and continued to come back. So that's one part of it. Another part of it is again these, these policy interventions, smoke free housing. Well, I mean, if, if we, if we uh, promote smoke free housing, then that helps. Um, nurse family partnership and, and home visitation programs. We know getting folks involved from the start. There's not a, a there, there's hardly an, a point in your life when you have folks more ready for change than when a baby's coming into the family. Everyone's excited about this new baby. They're out buying gifts. And so it's a time when we really need to, uh, to, to better utilize our advocacy efforts and bring everyone into the fold and not just mom. But I love the home visitation because you're bringing it to the home. Because one of the problems is dad and grandma and grandpa aren't going to come to each of the prenatal visits. But if those prenatal visits are happening in the home, then you can talk about the importance of being smoke free and the resources that are available for folks out there. I think another thing we need to do is, is really dig into our data, and I did this in Indiana. We found in some communities, smoking was the biggest risk factor. In other communities, birth spacing was the biggest risk factor. In other communities, it was something completely different. And so we can't assume, again, that the averages represent the individual communities. And then finally, we have 92 counties in Indiana. We have about 1,000 zip codes. Um, and, uh, and what we found was that it was just, I think it was about 20 of the zip codes in Indiana represented over half of the infant mortality. And so one of the things we do in public policy is we try to boil the ocean. If we take 
I got $13 million from the legislature along, uh, you know, to, to fight infant mortality. It sounds like a lot of money. You spread it over uh, you know, 92 counties and almost 1,000 zip codes, that becomes nothing very quickly. You focus it in on 20 problem zip codes and really understand the root causes and you can start to move things. And that's one of the things we're doing here in, in, uh, in the Cleveland area uh, with our HIV initiative. Uh, uh, your county here is one of the counties that we've targeted as one of the 50 counties in the uni United States that has a higher than average rate of HIV transmission. And so I'm really proud to say uh, that, that this administration has made a commitment to ending HIV in the next 10 years and doing that by targeting the 50 counties where, uh, again, the problem is the worst as opposed to spreading money all over the United States. So again, better data, um, be uh, better policies, and creating an environment for folks to be successful as opposed to playing that, that whack-a-mole, one-off approach. Okay, now we got the mom. Let's get the dad. Okay, now we got the dad. Let's get the grandma. Okay, now we got the grandma. Uncle comes in and smokes. Well, if you make housing smoke-free and they're living in, in, in a housing complex, you just took care of everybody right there in one fell swoop. So the policy initiative works so much more effectively than trying to do the one-off. Great. I think we have another question. Uh, my name is Julie Patterson. I'm with the AIDS Funding Collaborative here in Cuyahoga ah, County. See, we te I teed you up. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm actually a former Hoosier as well, so I want to welcome you to Cleveland. Thank you. Where are you and, from? Uh, from Bloomington, Indiana oh, University. Yeah. So um, I wanted to ask, uh, I, first of all, I want to thank you for bringing in naloxone and demonstrating that with us and uh, for mentioning HIV several times uh, because I know you learned quite a bit in Indiana. Mm -hmm. and. I think one of the things I'd like to give you the opportunity to reflect on is your, your change of heart around harm reduction and particularly, you queued yourself up right around syringe exchange. If you mm -hmm. don't mind speaking about that with us, please. Well, you know, uh, and that's a great story to end on because it's a good story to, to reflect partnerships. And I said earlier when Dan and I were having a, a discussion on, on climate change that we in public health can tend to be pretty arrogant at times. We like to stand up at these lecterns and tell people, I know what's best for you, and you better do it, and if you don't, then you're some backwoods yokel who, uh, who's, who's gonna have bad outcomes. And when I was in Indiana, we had an HIV outbreak. I'm a, uh, I have a public health degree, I'm a physician, I worked at a, uh, at, a, at a tertiary care center. I knew what we needed to do from a scientific point of view. I also knew if this black guy who went to Berkeley um, from Indianapolis tried to tell this all white rural community that I was gonna do something that they found, quite frankly, morally repugnant to them without engaging them, that they were just gonna set up a roadblock around the syringe service program that I set up and no one would ever come in and out of it. But what's funny is there were people all over the United States, not all over, but mostly on the coast who wrote articles about how we didn't respond fast enough to the HIV outbreak and how I should have used my authority to force needles on the community. And you all live here in Ohio. That would have pragmatically never worked. I drove down to the community. I had a beer with the local sheriff. I asked him, what are your concerns? Conservative Navy SEAL. He said, I'm concerned about jail overcrowding. I said, well, if we do this syringe service program right, then we'll connect people to care and more people will get into treatment and recovery and not be in your jails. He said, I'm concerned about uh, my officers getting stuck with needles. I said, you know, that's a valid concern. It's important that you validate people's concerns. I said, that's a valid concern. Guess what, Sheriff? The studies show that if we do a syringe service program, it lowers needle stick injuries to law enforcement by 60%. And so I'm going to tell you all something that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's been portrayed in multiple different ways in the media and it still gets portrayed in the media. It's, it's funny because uh, I like to think that health should be apolitical, but, but many times it ends up being forced into political lenses. And there are still articles coming out talking about how uh, we were slow to respond in Indiana. And I'm not going to call anybody out, but there's a very blue, very prominent city right now that has an HIV outbreak going on related to injection drug reuse that is much worse than the one we had in Scott County, Indiana. And I was there visiting, and they were much slower to respond than we were in Scott County, Indiana. And nobody's talking about them or writing articles about them. But that said, um, again, we had to engage the community. People need to know that you care before they care what you know. 
And again, there's a lot of folks out there that don't think that we care. And so part of my engagement, it, it wasn't a change in, of heart. I knew what the science said. I knew what we needed to do. I knew that there was no way I was going to be able to do it with a, a top-down, authoritative, um, ivory tower approach. I knew that I had to go there and engage the folks. And sometimes you've got to, in, in, with engaging folks, again, that's democracy. That, that, that's compromise. Sometimes you don't get the whole loaf. Sometimes you got to take the half a loaf and ease your way into it. And uh, one of the things I'm most proud of from my public health career is that after that, Kentucky, based on our model, went from zero to 50 syringe service programs. People all across the country looked at that as a model, and it became an impetus for change because of the approach that we took. If I'd gone in there and passed out needles all over the place, and that serv syringe service program got shut down, there wouldn't have been a model, and there maybe wouldn't be syringe service programs all over Kentucky and, all, and increased all over the United States. And so I, I took a little time there because, number one, it's very personal to me both from I'm proud of it, but it's also very personal to me because folks still take political swipes and attacks at what I think was a very effective, and in many cases, a case study in how you actually do public policy versus write scientific papers. And I think it's important that, that we remember we, that, that the key word to, in public policy is public, and that you have to partner to get a lot of these things accomplished. And if you partner, that doesn't mean that I get everything that I want or that Dan gets everything that he wants. It means Dan gets a little bit of what he wants, I get a little bit of what I want. Neither one of us are as happy as we could be, but we both leave as friends. We both feel, leave feeling like we moved the ball a little bit towards the goalpost in a positive direction. And we're set up to partner again the next go round when the next catastrophe comes up. And I can call up Dan then and say, hey, we had a good relationship the last time around. I need you again. Well, Dr. Jerome Adams, I want to thank you for being a friend to Cleveland. It's been great having you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Vice. And I want, to thank, I want to thank all of you all for being here and for the, those who are joining us online. Thank you for the, uh, you and to everyone here for the, uh, for the questions. Um, some of them were tough, they were all fair, and I hope you all appreciated uh, my transparency. Uh, one thing I always try to do is to be as honest and as transparent as possible. Um, I hope you got a little insight into the way that I try to solve problems in a federal role where it's not my job to um, represent one party or another, or one state or another, or one region or another. It's my job to be the Surgeon General of the United States. And that's quite frankly difficult to try to balance some of these competing issues in a complex climate. But uh, my ultimate goal at the end of the day is always to try to push us a little bit towards health with each and every decision we make and each and everything we do. And uh, thank you all for partnering with me to do that. Thank you very much for being a part of it. We really, really appreciate having you here. All right, I need your help on something real quick here. In a second, I'm going to have you ring the gong. Let me just read this. All right. Our forum today is sponsored by University Hospitals. Hospitals. We are delighted to have Tom Zenti and his colleagues from University Hospitals with us today. Thank you very much for your support of City Club Programming. Our community partner today is Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging. Additionally, we welcome guests at tables hosted by the Center for Health Affairs, Cleveland Clinic, Metro Health System, Sisters of, and the Sisters of Charity Health System. Thank you all for joining us today. That is the end of our forum. Thank you, Dr. Adams, Mr. Vice Admiral, sir. Thank you, members and friends of the City Club. Our forum is now adjourned. Yeah, we're going to do a picture. Yeah. Stay right here. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad. Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.